look, at some point you change from being a founder to being a CEO. And you go from um, being fully about evangelizing and selling and building and doing all that stuff to thinking about how do you connect um, finding the money and allocating it. Ben, I'm excited to continue our, our conversation, um, this time to hear more about your journey, your story. Tell me, eight, eight years ago, coming up on nine, for Splash, where did this all start? Tell me about your story. The way this happened was we were at uh, South by Southwest 2012. We had built uh, a piece of um, workflow technology for events called One Clipboard, and it was not working out. No one was using it. and South by Southwest, we did a Hail Mary pass, launched a piece of technology to promote our other company, One Clipboard, and we called it Splash. And it got picked up by Mashable, they launched it. And then all of a sudden we had Spotify and Google and the Gansevoort Hotel Group, which at the time was a big deal, using our product at South by. And we knew that it was catching fire. So. You know, I, I had previously been an event planner. I was uh, the head of events for Thrillist and one of the co-founders of a big conference called the Summit Series. And I had been just, tr I had been banging my head for so long against just trying to make my events look as cool online and in the invitation and pre and post as they did in my mind, or even as good as the event was. Sometimes the event was so cool, I couldn't tell anyone about it. It's hard to really put it out there. And so really what, what, what you know, stood us out was our willingness to really make sure your event looked awesome. And it ended up really contributing to a viral loop. Uh, people who RSVP'd were able to pick up the software and create their own events. And that's still a viral loop that we have in the system now, which is great, it feeds our freemium product. Fast forward, one year, two year, three years, it's the typical software journey. You, you, you listen to your customers, you build pieces of tech and services to match them, and you, you, you kind of add it on until, lo and behold, you have an enterprise business. And then you get to a certain point, you realize that, you know, you need to change the engine and you do that. And so it's, that's, that's been the process. At this point, you know, we're really proud. We, we, we serve several Fortune 500 companies, um, some of the top technology companies in the world use Splash to power all their events. And also we still have a small event planner, you know, contingent of, of event planners, small businesses or small teams at large businesses who pick us up on their own and host events. And it's great. It's really cool to watch. You know, it still has this organic engine to it that, that really makes the business rewarding. It's fun to see the whole thing grow. There's a lot of stages in, in a, you say, a traditional tech journey, right? The, the yeah, first yeah. In, in founding and getting started, funding is one big thing. How Did you bootstrap it? When did you get funding? How did that all work for you? What challenges do you have to overcome with that? Oh, man. It, you know, the funding environment. I've, I've, uh, anyone who's had an easy time fundraising will have to tell me about it. I, you know, it has never been so easy. Uh, a lot of no's, especially early. A lot of finding believers and getting getting them to, to buy in early, um, and also you know we've gone through a couple cycles at this point of the economy, especially this most recent one. So you know making sure to, to keep investors you know focused on that long term vision. It's it's been a it's been a game. It's it's been hard, but I got to tell you uh, we were able to get some really top tier investors early on, and they've been supportive ever since. That's been a big deal for us. Any particular tactics that you would recommend that you're like, oh, this, this worked? Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into it. Look, I, I think that the, the, the biggest unlockers for me were, number one, recognizing that the people that you're talking to that are investors are financially oriented. And so they like to speak money. And so if you're talking product or you're talking marketing, they're just waiting for you to start talking about money. And when I say money, I mean unit economics. I mean, you know, they can be future facing unit economics. They can be uh, bottom line essentially, or eventual growth. Uh, th that's what they're interested in talking about. 
I think that's number one. Number two is, look, at some point you change from being a founder to being a CEO. And you go from um, being fully about evangelizing and selling and building and doing all that stuff to thinking about how do you connect um, finding the money and allocating it, and allocating those resources to the right departments who know what to do better than you do most of the time. Um, and that's, that's a process. And look, as I've become, as I said, as, I, as I've been trying to become a CEO, um, a lot of that has been forcing my mind to think about it through the investor lens. And it really that does still come back to money. That's what this is about, is building a valuable enterprise that creates wealth for everyone who's part of it, all the stakeholders, employees and investors. That's a powerful realization of the mind shift from founder to CEO and just allocation of the right new resources to the right people who know what to do to make a scale. So then speaking of the, the growth then, the kind of the next, once you've got funny, you've got, it, got the team, it's actually building the team. Um, how, what was that like to build the right team and how has that changed over the years? I mean, the whole gig is recruitment, right? And identifying who's the right person for the right time and the right job. Was there any uh, tactics that have jumped out in your mind thinking back like, wow, actually that was a good way to, to build the right person, find the right person or build the right team or collective? Uh, you know, I think the thing that I, I would offer to any entrepreneur is um, remove hope from whether or not someone can do a job, know that they can do a job, ask and get very specific about whether or not they can do a job. I think that'd be number one. I think number two is being really cognizant that you're kind of making, um, you're making longer decisions as the business gets bigger. What I mean by that is you're thinking about somebody who can fill a role for three, you know, three years, five years at this stage. And earlier you're, you're really looking for people who can fill roles for a year or even six months. And so kind of the time horizon of the roles that people fill. Interesting. Change. But I, I think and just to put a finer point on that, um, the people who really end up sticking with you, I've found, are the ones that also understand that, that they're playing a role. And even if their title doesn't change, that their role drastically does almost every quarter. And so I would offer that, you know, keeping track of the people who really get that mindset of it's, it's about change and how fast you can change. Um, they're going to be able to kind of to play this game. And if not, it's helpful to communicate that to them. Setting the right them. expectations. Yeah. But it, I guess that's, that's the big download there. The okay. roles just shift both in terms of what they are and as long as well as how long they last as the business mm -hmm. changes. Uh, what, what was it like to get the first couple clients? Now you mentioned like you actually got the, the, the one who put on South by Southwest. What is it like to get those first couple clients on board? What do you do? What's a tactic that work for you? Look, I, I think that I'd offer that the same thing about specificity plays. We, we have, we have a, a value at Splash called Love the Details. And I, I would put that into hiring, but I'd also put that into selling. I think that especially in the early stages of things that clients really respected about us was that we got our hands dirty and we made sure that, that we were really working with where we're often complex programs. I mean, again, I'm in the event space. Events are just by definition, super complex. And then many events are just turn that, you know, exponentialize that. But at least our organization, we, we always spent a lot of time making sure that people were successful, that businesses were successful, that programs worked. And a lot of that means getting into the weeds, especially in the early days. And what I find is that, uh, yeah, like I, we look, we hire people who can get in the weeds. I personally, you know, or at least in the early days would really get in the weeds. Um, and then the game is how do you scale that? You know, how do you find ways to automate that and, and grow that? Um, Did you personally uh, like reach out to build those first initial clients showing like, Hey, we're, we're in this, we got the details. How did you get those first couple of clients? Definitely. Well, again, you know, look, I, we really benefited from our viral engine. And so I would offer that if, if there's an opportunity to put a free product, free trial, some sort of virality into your business, I'd spend all your time on that because it really decreases the cost of acquisition down the road and can, it can change the economics drastically. Um, but yes, oh my gosh, look, I was told, you know, that these, that, yeah, you got to get in everybody's face. I mean, it is, it is a sales job to be a CEO. Um, and look, I'd argue that there's a lot of CEOs that that's not 
um, their best uh, talent, their, their zone of genius, as they say. Um, that's okay. Um, find somebody who can put you in front of those people and help you also contribute your vision. I, I'd argue that every founder is a seller, right? Is getting out there. And that can be on the recruitment side, sure, but also just with clients. It really helps to hear from the founding team. Um, and there's ways for anybody. You're, you're, you're a big fan, you stated there, of the freemium model. You feel like that there's built-in virality and that you, would you attribute then your, a lot of your growth to the fact that you have a freemium yeah, model? The coolest part about freemium is that like, it does so many things for the business. It creates a, a layer of testing, people who test it and QA it, because you better believe the freemium people are on you even before the enterprise can be. It also uh, helps you, under, it gives you a, a wider net of who's actually using the products. You can really start to test things out, see what the market's responding to. You also just start to see just a lot of creativity out of the freemium product. And as I mentioned, it delivers leads. I mean, this is the best way to give someone an opportunity to work with you is to let them try it, you know, especially in today's day and age. Um, I would argue that there, it, it, any business, it, freemium can be very challenging too. It has its downsides, it has security risks, it has, um, uh, uh, you have to think about your, your, your user set differently. And that can be really, that can be a lot to handle. Um, so I'd argue that maybe if you're thinking about a free offering, um, you could also be thinking about a free trial, uh, a, a smaller package, just a way to take a bite of the apple. I, I do feel strongly about that for any business. You, you start off, you need just anybody, right? Just give me some customers, give me some clients on board. You start working with them, you, you get your, your proof of concept, you've got customers, great. But now, how do you really go to market? How do you scale? Any thoughts or tactics that you found that have worked to, to be able to make that? Okay, so I think the essence of your question is around how do you essentially develop multiple channels and know that there are, and essentially measure and track each of the different sources that are coming into your business, yeah? Um, you know, I, I guess the only thing I'd offer is to really think about each of those channels as its own PL and its own funnel. And it, each one is gonna have different tactics. I can speak to ours, you know, we have a outbound team, we have an inbound a marketing engine. We have our freemium product, which delivers leads. We also have a partnership strategy, which essentially is looking to do cross-selling alongside organizations like Marketo or Salesforce. Um, we've even started to break out territory, um, such as uh, EMEA or APAC. So long story short, uh, something that I wish I had done a better job of in the very early stages was measure what worked and what were the best methods and how did the funnel move in each of those different channels. I think that would, that would have saved me a couple steps. Because you could easily waste a lot of time on one that's not performing where another one, if you weren't paying attention to the metrics, is actually doing really well. I think the major point there is that they will perform differently and will require different tactics and will require different in investments and teams. It's, it, they're, just, they're just different businesses. Uh, what what challenges do you see you're going to need to overcome going forward in light of the current circumstances, COVID, both externally, reaching out, sales marketing, as well as internally with your own team? Yeah, look, you know, I, I think that any leader out there has, has to be scratching their head as to how they lead effectively in this new reality. You know, I, I can tell you, I, I feel um, disconnected from the people in our business. Uh, our office, we had, we had an office at the top floor of the Woolworth building. We put a lot of elbow grease into making our culture come through the walls there. And it's, it's hard to do that digitally. Look, I, in my mind, if we can unlock what I'd call micro connections in the business, really allowing people to have intimate conversations, to have reasons to connect and feel kind of the energy and the momentum of the business, I think we'll get through this. I, I, I personally don't believe in a fully distributed team. I think that FaceTime of some sort is important. So I can't wait to get back to that. But to your, to your question, I, it, it's an area that I'm thinking a lot about. How do I step into a leadership role virtually? And my, my, my best answer right now is a lot of little conversations, micro interactions that make all the difference. Last uh, question I have for you. 
what kind of tech innovations do you predict we will see in the near term next year or so? And then long term, like five, 10 years. So two yeah. questions. I mean, how, how much do you want me to get into it? Uh, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time looking at the virtual event space. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah. Okay. Um, the thing that I'm most excited about is basically that um, there are a lot of new services that now you can build on top of to create virtual experiences. And so you're starting to see both a lot of investment into creating virtual experiences and a lot of um, services for those. So similarly to when my business was being created, there was Stripe being created and AWS was taking off and you know, SendGrid. So you had all these services that allowed us to build a business fast and focus on the nice to haves, right? Because a lot of those need to haves were taken care of by best in class point solutions. That's happening right now. It's happening in streaming. It's happening in uh, presentation software, open broadcast software, OBS. It's happening in chat. Um, it's happening, you know, even in like data layers, right, on top of this stuff. And so what you're starting to see is a lot of really interesting ideas finally being possible with a lot less investment. And so, look, that's a, it's a lot of why we chose the strategy we did. I believe fully that we don't even know yet what the best experience is for virtual, right? We're, we're probably three years away, right? From a great virtual experience, probably. If, if we were to continue at this pace, I would even put it a three year away from it being like awesome. And so for that reason, our game and, and my kind of, my stance is integrate with everything. Watch the big players because they're going to be moving even faster, right? And they have a lot of effort and attention on their experiences. And keep an eye on the small guys. Make sure that they're, you, they can also work with our software. And yeah, so long story short, I think the attendee experience is like two years away, like the real one. And, you know, my, my expectation is when someone unlocks, I'll call it serendipity or true navigation in a virtual experience, like moving in and out of conversations, activities, feeling connection with a person through that collaboration and that collaborative navigation. I think we'll have been there. We will have entered into a brave new world at that point. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.